I'm going to look at verse 4 through 13, and there's chapter, verse 9, chapter 9, of verse 1. <clears throat> Notice what Jeremiah is saying. Jeremiah is known as the weeping prophet. Forty years he wept with a message. He was thrown in every prison there was. He was thrown in a cistern, which was a waste product of human waste. And he was literally thrown there. But the message God gave him, especially this one, was to the nation of Israel who walked away from God, who turned away from God, Listen to the message that God gave us through Jeremiah. Verse 4, say to them, this is what the Lord says. When people fall down, do they not get up? When someone turns away, do they not repent or do they not return? And the word return is repent there. Why then have these people turned away? Why does Jerusalem always turn away? They cling to deceit. They refuse to return. I have listened attentively, but they do not say what is right. None of them repent of their wickedness, saying, what have I done? Every, every Each pursue their own course, like a horse charges into a battle. Even the stork in the sky knows her appointed seasons. The dove, the swift, and the thrust observe the time of their migration. But my people do not know the requirements of the Lord. How can you say we are wise, for we have heard the law of the Lord, when actually the lion pen of the scribes those are the ones who translated or wrote the word, has handed, handled it falsely. The, the wise will be put to shame. They may be dismayed and trapped. Since they have rejected the word of the Lord, what kind, what kind of wisdom do they have? Therefore, I give their wives to other men and their fields to new owners. From the least to the greatest, all are greedy for gain. Prophets and priests alike, all practice deceit. They dress the wounds of my people as though it was not serious. Peace, peace, they say, when there is no peace. Are they ashamed of their detestable conduct? No, they have no shame at all. They do not even know how to blush. So they will fall among the fallen. They will be brought down when they are punished, saith the Lord. And I will take away their harvest, declares the Lord. There will be no grapes on the vine, and there will be no figs on the tree and their leaves will wither, wither. What I've given them will be taken away from them. You who, are a comfort, who are, you who are my comforter in sorrow, my heart is faint within. Oh, that my head would be springs of water, that my eyes a fountain of tears. I would weep day and night for the slain of my people. May God add understanding, wisdom, and also his drawing fact, uh, drawing uh, faith to us. 1947, there was a man named Robert Pierce who worked for a ministry, a nonprofit organization that was called the Youth for Christ. He was a burdened young man. He, was, he, he wanted to go to the mission field. He wanted to evangelize the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. The young evangelist started towards China with only enough money to buy a ticket to Honolulu. On the trip, he met Tina, a teacher, she was introduced to him as a battered, introduced to him a battered and a abandoned child named White Jade. And able to care for the child herself, she asked Pierce, what are you going to do with her? Pierce gave her five dollars, the last dime he had. And he agreed to send that amount each month to her to take care of this girl. This girl. Pierce eventually made it to China, where thousand made public commitments to follow Jesus Christ during his four-month evangelical efforts. Where there Pierce was wide, he saw the widespread hunger. He felt intense passion for those people. Pierce later wrote these words in the flyleaf fly leaf of his Bible. Let my heart be broken with the things that break the heart of God. Dragging a movie camera across Asia, China was soon closed. And Pierce showed the resulting pictures to churches all the way, up, all the way around North America. He asked for money to help the children. He showed their faces and begged Christians to adopt one of them. 1950 incorporated this personal crusade that's now known as World Vision. 1959, a journalist, Richard Jimmon, wrote this. Pierce cannot conceal his true emotions. He seems to be, to be one of the few naturally and uncontrollably honest men I've ever met. Pastor Richard Halvinser wrote this about Pierce, praying more earnestly and unrelentingly than anyone, I el anyone else I know. 
it was as though the prayer burned within his heart. Bob Pierce functioned from a broken heart. Jeremiah, like Bob, literally served God with a broken heart. When you read Jeremiah's words, understand and he, he understand he wrote those words weepingly. His heart was broken for the things that broke God's heart. And so he begins to write Jeremiah out of a broken heart because he wept because the children of Judah would not repent and would not return to him. And so he read, wrote these words knowing that they would not hear, they would not heed, and yet he continued to write. He was known as the weeping prophet because his heart was so broken over the plight and condition of those people. His heart ached. And as, ch as, as challenging as Pierce was, and his work was to raise money supporting the needy people, Jeremiah's me message was just as difficult. They both ministered and wrote from a broken heart. He was sent to deliver a hard message, Jeremiah was, and so was Pierce, a message that required people to repent, to change, and alter their lives. And then as now, most people don't respond well to a personal message that requires behavioral change. The typical response was, who are you to tell me what to do? Who is God to tell me what to do? Who has given the right to a pastor or a Sunday school teacher or a teacher to tell me what to do? I live my life, I'm in charge of my life, and I'll do what I want to do. Yet Mer Jeremiah proclaimed the message, and he did it with tears in his eyes. Jeremiah's morning, a morning was prefigured of the Lord Jesus Christ. In similar manner, Jesus wept over the needs of people. He wept over people's sin. His heart was broken because they were weary and they were worn out like sheep without a shepherd. They did not where to, know where to go. They did not hear the shepherd's voice and they would not turn from their ways that was leading to damnation. The ministry of Christ was a tearful ministry. In fact, if you read Christ's ministry, you will see his heart broken over and over and over again. Even on the cross of Calvary, Jesus was broken because he saw people leaving him, running from him, not listening to him. And right before him was the Son of God who was dying for their sins, and he, they would not heed, they would not listen, and it never broke their heart. The summary of his ministry was offered up in Hebrews. It says, during his earthly life, he offered prayers and appealed with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard, and not heard really because of the reverence. His ministry broke his heart, and his ministry cost his life. What breaks our heart? What breaks our heart? What breaks your heart? What truly breaks our heart that brings us and drives us to our knees, that drives us to an altar, whether it be in our home or here at the church? What breaks our heart. This morning as I walked in, a lady in the church, and I'll mention her name, but Nancy said to me that I was a dipstick. Can you imagine that? A dipstick? I've never been called that in all my ministry. She did it with a laughing heart. Not a broken heart. A laughing smile on her face. Not with a broken smile. But please pray for her. She needs to turn from her wicked ways. I am in trouble and I need your prayers, and I'm not going out that way this morning. I'm going out as fast as I can that way. But seriously, what, what breaks our heart? What breaks God's heart? I believe, first of all, people who will not return, no repent of their sins, breaks the heart of God. The difference between literally returning and repentance, returning is getting accepting the message. Repentance is literally acknowledging the message and turning around and going the other way. There are a whole lot of folks, and you'll hear this later on, there are a whole lot of folks who accept the message, they hear the message, but they will not listen to the message enough to turn from their wicked ways. And so they live their lives in churches, even as officers and pastors of churches and teachers of churches who have literally accepted the message of returning to God, but they never have repented of their sins. Repented means stop it. It means don't do it again. It's a changed life. It is so different than the world has and many times the church has. And I will say that again. God told Jeremiah, he said, why have these people turned away from me and not turned to me? Why is Jerusalem always turning away? In fact, he says, they hold, they're full of deceit. Verse 5 of chapter 8. They refuse to return. Their hearts are deceitful. They've been listening to the wrong message. And you know who has given them the wrong message? The lion scribes. Their pen was a lion's words. They did not listen to the true word of God. 
In fact, the people in Jeremiah's day had turned away from God, but they've never, and they really refused to repent. So they turned away from God, and then they never came back to God. They were never repented to God. And literally, they had no desire to return to God, even though God has offered them everything. They had opportunity after opportunity, but instead, the people deliberately charged ahead and kept going the way they were doing and going with their literally their sinful practices like a war horse charges into a battle. They literally had no idea of the danger that was involved. They thought God has forgiven them just because they come to the altar and said, I, I believe you, I accept you. But they get up and do the same thing over and over and over again. They've never repented of their chance since. They've never said, God, I will no longer do this. I will no longer live this life. I will no longer listen to the world. I will change my whole life. I will be a different person because you have saved me, which means you have changed me. Sometimes Jesus in our lives changes our thinking, but we don't allow him to change our hearts and our ways. They should have known better. In fact, Jeremiah reminded them that when people fall, don't they get up again? When people fall, don't they get up again? Then why does Judah fall but never gets up? Why does my church fall but they never learn a lesson? They never get back up. If one takes the wrong road and sometimes we get lost, don't we turn around? Don't we turn back the way we ought to be going? Isn't it interesting? Even the birds know when it's time to migrate. Otherwise, the birds knew, know when it's time to go back to where they were. We as children of God many times, and he's talking to children of God, the Judah. Judah, they were God's chosen people. And yet they got where they shouldn't be, but they never migrated back to where they ought to be. What a crying shame. People should be obedient to God's instruction. They ought to return. They ought to repent of their sins. One of the greatest problems in modern Christianity is that we practice confession of sin, but we do not practice repentance of sin. We hold on to the right result. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. Listen to me carefully. 1 John was written to Christians. In fact, 37, 38 times, it uses the word agosto, which is literally the word to, to know. You can know. And what he's saying... All those times, the Bible, 1 John was written to Christians, not to sinners. Many times we use 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, and if we, he is faithful and righteous, or faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and literally cleanse all of us from all unrighteousness. That is written to Christians. Because a Christian many times turns away from God. A Christian many times literally continues to sin. And what he's saying here, you are my children, I know you know me as your parents, but why do you continue to sin? Why do you not repent of your sins? Turn from your wicked ways. Why don't you come back to me, and I will make you a righteous child of God? But we refuse to do, refuse to do that. In fact, we don't heed God's word. We don't listen to God's word. Luke chapter 5, verse 32 says, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. The sinners to repentance. In fact, we treat repentance as a one-time act at conversion. But listen to me carefully. And what happens is this. Our confession is needed all the time. Every one of us mostly sin every day. You ever get angry? You ever said the wrong thing about a person? You ever argue about someone with someone? Have you ever did certain things in your life? And listen to me. Sins don't go away as a Christian. They must be repented away. We've got to call sin what it is. Here's what we think. Well, you committed adultery. All I did was lie. So your sin is worse than my sin. Where do you get that, where do you get that in the Bible? Sin, sin. Sin, sin. And so what God is saying, confess your sins. It's a daily act. Whenever I pray every day, I say, God, would you forgive me of my sin? Would you forgive me of my attitude? Would you forgive me of my anger? Would you forgive me of this, this, and this? And listen, once I open the floodgates to heaven where I repent of my sins, I turn away from them, I'm going to stop doing them, then God opens the floodgates of His Holy Spirit in my life and reveals to me what I need to know. A lot of times what happens, we like children are caught in misbehavior. Here's what we say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, only to repent the same thing over and over. One fellow said he was sorry to me, and you know what I said? I know you are. Let me repeat that again. A fellow said to me, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I know he was. Most of us are sorry we're not repentant. We're sorry we got caught. We're not sorry enough to repent of it. And we'll go right back in it. Because we think when we say our sorry, it's all covered. It's just as if we never sinned. So therefore, the next sin is the first sin we ever committed. 
We think just because we say, I'm sorry to God. Listen, true repentance is, God, I'm guilty. I'm wrong. Will you forgive me of my sins? God, I promise you I won't do it again. Help me keep that promise. And that's what true repentance is. We do the same thing with God as children do with their parents. How often do you find yourself saying to God, I'm sorry, only to repeat it the same sin over and over and over again? I I deal with a lot of folks who come to the altar Sunday after Sunday when they come to church and they'll keep saying to God, I'm sorry, but they keep doing that sin. Listen to me. You don't commit sin because you're not aware of it. You commit sin because you are aware of it. It's inside. And what's inside will come outside. What we think inside will come outside. Garbage in, garbage out. And what we think is we can get by with it. That's such a little sin, it's not going to bother God. Here's what happens when I sin. I begin to shut off like a Venetian blinds my, my conversation with God. And God will not answer my prayer. God will not deal with me as someone who keeps sinning only if and after I repent of my sins. I ask like, God, will you, I re, I literally, and you ask God, will you forgive me? Listen, you have no right to pray if you're not right with God. The Bible's even very clear. He said, if you're a marriage person and you keep arguing and you have that in your home or in your life, and I'm paraphrasing, God will not hear your prayers. You shut off that, that, that way to heaven. You shut off that, that stream to heaven. Many times we don't realize that. How often we find ourselves saying to God, I'm sorry, and repeat it over and over and over again. To turn from sin is to cease doing it. It literally is stop it. It's done. I'm done with it. I am going to quit. That's what repentance is. The evangelist Sammy Tibbet wrote, too many in the, Western, in the West desire to know the manifest of God without the manifest of His holiness. God, you're a God of love. But wait a minute. He is a God of holiness who cannot put up with sin, who cannot have a relationship with someone who's in sin because holiness blocks, blocks the blackness of sin. Jesus came and died on the cross so that he'd open the, 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 the communications with us. And we have to understand that. Yes, yes, Jesus died for everyone, but listen to me, only those who believe, only those who accept, only those who repent will have their sins forgiven. Repentance is a gift of grace. In fact, a repentant person is willing to leave his destructive path. And listen to me, and as a slave will leave the gallery, as a prisoner wants to get out of the jail, as a thief wants to give up his goods, and literally as a beggar who wants out of his uh, his rags and wants to dress right. Repentance sets us free. So what breaks our heart? Well, secondly, I think what will break our heart is people who won't allow God's Word to guide them. They know the Word of God, they read the Word of God, but they refuse to let it literally guide them. They reject God's Word. In fact, the people possessed the Word of God, otherwise they had it. But they didn't practice it, they didn't accept it, they didn't obey the Word of God. You know, Bibles are all over our country. And it's still the number one, I'm going to say it again, but there's still the number one book in, the, in, in America, in the world, world, really. And yet it's the least book read. Isn't it interesting that year in, year out, our Bible, the Bible is the bestseller. And again, I said it's popular, but it's not being kept in the Western world. It is literally crumbling morals, and we're crumbling in spiritual, a lack of spirituality in our country. There's a little connection, very little connection, between people who, who, who have the Bible and say they have the Bible and they read the Bible and they believe the Bible, but they don't act the Bible. Could the problem lie in the fact that we may read God's Word and believe God's Word? Could the problem be that we do not obey it? In the words of James, he said, Be doers of the Word, not hearers only, deceiving yourself. A doer of the Word takes the Bible, applies it to his life, and changes his way. But here's what James says, you hear it, but you won't change your ways. We think because we say we're Christian, because we made a one-time trip to the altar, that we no longer have to ever repent to God. What would you do with a husband? What would you do with a wife who says they're sorry but continues to do the same thing over and over again? Maybe they beat you. And they say, and this happens a lot of times. Been called out on a lot of uh, domestic violence when I was with the Sheriff's Department in Spartanburg. A lot of domestic violence. And as a coroner's chaplain, I was called on a lot of women and men who were killed because of domestic violence. And the person that did it always says, I'm sorry. They told their wife, and you know, nowadays women, 
beat up their husbands just about as much as men beat up their wives. It used to be you go to a house and you went right to the husband. Now you go to the house and you got to take a look at both of them. But the husband or wife will tell you they've said they're sorry over and over again. And I took him back. I accepted his sorry stuff. But they knew that their spouse or their wife was not sorry. It was just a way to keep them in the marriage. And I think that's cruel and un unbelievable. It broke Jesus' heart when the scribes and the Pharisees, they were students of the word. In fact, all the people looked up to the scribes and the Pharisees because they were leaders. They were the religious leaders. So what happened? The scribes and Pharisees believed the word of God, but did you know they never practiced the word of God? They argued and debated Scripture, but they didn't accept Scripture. They didn't follow Scripture. They had the knowledge of the law. They just did not and would not apply it to their life. They thought it was somebody for someone else, not for themselves. In fact, James reminds us, he said, humbly receive the implanted word which is able to save. You know what the implanted word is? It's the word that you've taken in. But you won't let your life change your life. You know the word. You have the word. And by the way, that's going to be a very dangerous person when it comes to judgment of God. You had the opportunity where the people around the world did not. You had the Bible where people around the world did not. You had your opportunity after opportunity after opportunity, but you never took that opportunity and, and asked me, and for, uh, you never repented to me. We must give it our full attention. Listen, the Word of God is not there for us not to pay attention. And what I'm saying about that, when we do that, we are then teachable and yielded our lives, and we're humble, and we're willing to be changed. Unless I'm willing to be changed, I'll never be changed. In fact, when we begin to put God's Word into practice, it changes our heart, and it now changes our life. We'll see people as Jesus saw them. We will begin to hurt over the things and justice of our world as it broke God's heart. We'll be sensitive to the, the, the lonely <coughs> and to the abused and the neglected. We can be so used to seeing people in a bad spot in their life, broken and hurt and ruined, and we just walk right by them as they don't exist. And in no more affects our heart. It no more breaks our heart because we become used to that. Here's what we say. They deserve it because of what they've done. What do we deserve what, what, because of what we've done? We think, oh, well, you know, they, they're just there. I'm not going to pay attention to them. We don't really say it out loud, but we think it. We walk right by. It doesn't bother us. We get so used to sin, it no longer bothers us. We get used to people in sin and their lives being ruined that it no longer affects us. It lo no longer buys us or bothers us. We will cry for the lost and the dying without him. And we'll do that. We'll feel deeply about passion to reach the world. We ought to do that when we begin to really be affected with the things that broke God's heart. But when we do, it no longer bothers us. We can see it, but it no longer touches our heart. Thirdly, people who don't see the urgency of the hour. And folks, Jeremiah wrote it this way. Harvest has passed. Summer has ended. But we have not been saved. In fact, the harvest really is two ways, two different ways. The former was time for gathering the grain. The latter was time to gather the fruit. And so if you did not have, you had a bad grain crop, you always hoped you'd get a good fruit crop. But if you had a bad fruit crop and a bad grain crop, you're in terrible trouble. Terrible trouble. And you were literally destroyed by it. And it would be said today, like it's always been said, time's up, the party's over. And the day's coming when time's up and our party is over. Our time is over. Our neglect is over. Our not paying to God is over. In fact, there comes a time when it will, and it is too late. I, I know a little about farming. I was raised on a little farm. I, do, I understand that farmers had a brief window. In Wyoming, you had a very brief window. It snows. I've seen snow in June. It snows. Then we have a little summer, and then it starts snowing again. You've got that little window to get your crops in. That little window to get, take care of your crop. Little window, window to ha harvest your crop. If you don't get them in and you don't harvest them, you won't have a result. You won't have the harvest of it. But here's the problem. I've seen many times in my home state where summer and spring, spring come, winter is over, spring comes, they couldn't put, it, put in their crop. You know why? Because it rained too much or got a late snow and it destroyed them. Or a hailstorm would come and destroy everything they had. They try the, frantically to fix that crop. 
and they realize they can't fix it. They paid all that money for seed, all that money for their tractors, all that money for the fuel, all that money for laborers, and guess what? They have no income. They have cattle, but they've got to sell their cattle. They have nothing to feed their cattle. Now they don't get a good price for their cattle because those that are buying it don't have a way to keep them up. It is tragedy. It is something destruction. We ought to have a similar need, a similar crying out, a similar broken heart that God does when he tells his story. Of the billions of people in the, in the world, did you know it is estimated that 30 million worldwide will die without Jesus Christ every year? 300 million. And, of the th of, and listen to me. It is estimated of the 300 million that live in America, only 34% of those people attend church. They don't attend it for Easter. They don't attend it for Christmas. And listen to me. They refuse to go to weddings and funerals that are, hit, that are, uh, that are got or, or, or in a church setting. They won't come because it's church. They won't come. They won't come to anything. They will not darken the doors of the church. 34% of Americans. And that's getting higher and higher and higher. Listen, as they, they're going to die, and they don't realize it, they're going to die and go into eternal damnation, eternal punishment. Without knowing Jesus Christ's love, Jesus' heart was broken over the harvest. He said this, the harvest is abundant, but the workers are few. Therefore, pray to the Lord for the harvest to send out workers into the field. Did you get that in Matthew chapter 9? He didn't say pray for the lost. He said pray for the harvesters. Who are the harvesters? Those who win, win people to Jesus Christ. Those who harvest the crop out of a lost and dying world. He said the harvest is gigantic, and the lost souls all over America and the world is gigantic, un unnumberable almost. And yet we as a church, we as individuals, refuse to win them to Jesus Christ. We go day after day, week after week, knowing that they're lost, and never ask them one question about Jesus Christ. We sit in a restaurant. We don't ask the, the, uh, the waiter if he or she is saved. We go to a grocery store. We don't pick up a conversation about salvation. Everywhere we go, opportunity after opportunity to win people to Jesus Christ, we walk in and walk out, and they still do not hear the message. I remember one time, his name, I won't give you his name, but him and his wife got a divorce. And you talk about an ugly divorce. He came and got saved, wonderfully saved. And he came to the office one day, he said, Preacher, will you go see my wife? She works at this grocery store. Go see her and witness to her. He didn't tell me how mean she was. <laughs> he didn't tell me she's ready to kill anybody that does that. So I walked in every day and bought a candy bar. It's because of her. And I buy a candy bar and I throw out a little bit. Boy, did she let me know. And I do it every day. Finally, one day she said, Preacher, what do you want? Kathy Vaudius. I said to her, Kathy, I'm concerned. I love you. Our church loves you, but more, God loves you more. I don't want to hear it. I left. Come back the next day. She said, Preacher, you want the same thing, something like that every day. And one day I went in there buying my candy bar. She said, Preacher, you don't need a candy bar. Tell me how to be saved. And I had a glorious opportunity to save. And him or, her and her husband are doing great. Her husband is a lay speaker. Their boys are preachers. But, man, that's how we win them. And the harvest is great. Everywhere, everywhere we go, everywhere, we ought to see people lost without the Lord Jesus Christ. Our heart was ought to be broken. Did you know that John F. Kennedy was assassinated? I hope you know that. But he said about three weeks before he was assassinated, this is what he said, and I quote, almost all presidents leave office feeling that their work is unfinished. I have a lot to do and so little time to do it. I have a lot to do and so little time to do it. As followers of Jesus Christ, we have a lot to do and a whole little bit of time to do it. We must give ourselves to him. Time is urgent. Remember, the gospel is only good news if it arrives on time. What breaks our heart? I think, fourthly, or thirdly, people who refuse to see, people who, no, I'm sorry, people who reject God's word for the cure. It, it is amazing to me the agony that, that parents sometimes have for the, reason, for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Pam and I have three children. We hurt when they hurt. We lose sleep when, they're have, when they have trouble. We feel pain when they're in pain. And I suppose only a parent can recognize that kind of emotion. When our children are, base, our children are basically good kids, but, and, and they, sometimes they right, make the right decision. But there are times when they make wrong choices, and the consequences of those wrong choices grieve our heart. 
I can only imagine the hurt of some parents here today that feel the, the helplessness they are when their children walk away. Watching their wayward child self-destruct. It breaks your heart. There's no explanation. There's no way I can tell you. I can never say to you, I know how you feel. No one can say that. You're not helping anybody if you say, I know how you feel. You don't know how they feel. You're not those parents. You're not walking their shoes. You don't know their history. And you don't know what they're going through right now. Don't ever say, I know how you feel. You don't. I always have to say, you know what? I know how I felt. I know how I felt. But I have no idea how you feel. You've got to be broken. You've got to be hurting. It must be pain that's almost incurable. And that's what it is to God. It's what it is to God's heart when he sees children, his children walk away from him, making bad decisions. Jeremiah saw Judah and the very, God's very people, very, God's very people. He saw them going down a slippery slope and literally going into self-destruction. His pain, his wounded heart, was reminiscent of the pain that Jesus Christ must have went through on Calvary. Can you imagine dying on the cro- of Calvary, seeing the whole world, going to hell, and there he was dying, and the very people that crucified him were laughing at him and mocking him. And yet he died for them. The one who created us loved, his, loved us as his own children. And when the shock and the burden of the sins of the people took hold of Jeremiah, Literally, it broke his heart. But when it took hold of Jesus Christ, he was literally praying so hard, there was like sweat drops of blood falling down from his face. He was in such agony that literally he was, his heart was broken. We ought to break. Our hearts ought to be breaking. Literally, when we, see, and we, when we see a hopeless and helpless generation that's blind and headed to hell. You know, Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 22 says, in, in, there is, is, is there no bomb in Gilead? It, that's a metaphor. Jeremiah saw that in Gideon, Gilead, which is east, and it was a restful town of Gilead. It was a place where there was a tree that growed and, uh, grew, and there was many of those. And they, in their resin, they could make a medicine that would heal wounds. They had the cure there. And it was a symbol of hope. It was a symbol of cure. Or cure. It was a symbol. It was the remedy. And Jeremiah was saying, the remedy exists for you, children. The remedy exists for you who are rejecting God. There it is. There's hope. There is now I can help you if you'll turn to God. And yet they know that. And they refuse to accept that. Listen, Jeremiah saw that. And his heart was broken. When would you think of a physician, a physician who had the cure for cancer? And you had cancer. And you walked in. He had the shot right there. He showed you the shock, the shot, but he wouldn't give it to you. Church, we are like that sometimes. We have the cure, but we don't show it to the world and give it to the world. Listen, the prophets really spoke the word of God, but the world then refused to get it. I can tell you about a shot, but if you refuse to take it, then it's up to you. In fact, do you know people who are sick who refuse to take medicine? Do you know, my friend, married couples whose marriage is on the rock, but they refuse to go to counseling? Listen. A lot of marriage couples will spend four, five, six thousand on the marriage and not a dime on the, on the I mean, a dime to get married, but a not, a, not a dime on the marriage. I had one couple, you wouldn't believe how much they spent on the marriage, on the wedding. And then they got in deep trouble. And they told me, we can't afford counseling. You spent five, six thousand, up to ten thousand, maybe more now, on a wedding, and you have nothing to spend after you get married. Our priorities are mixed up. When a big thing, look what we're doing. Oh, everybody come to our wedding. Look what we're doing. We're getting married. We're connecting. But then the marriage gets in trouble. And we won't spend a dime to correct that marriage. Not a dime. We got our priorities mixed up. In fact, do you know anyone, any employee who needs help, but they'll never go to the supervisor? Do you know anybody spiritually lost? But they refuse to turn to Jesus. They refuse to follow the one that has the cure. A 30-year-old man climbed over the retaining wall at Niagara Falls. And he jumped into that rapid water. In fact, quickly, the rushing current, which was a 173-foot drop. And even though he did not, he, did, he refused to come back or get saved or get rescued. You know that it, that it dumped over 675 gallons of water in every second? And he plunged in it. 
In fact, it began to throw him like a toothpick. And, and unbelievably, the man surfed from the bottom of that fierce waves and water. And when he got, when he, kept, he was conscious, he was swimming, even though he had a terrible gash on his head. The force of the falls ripped all of his clothes off. Very few ever have survived that fatal plunge. Niagara Police Sergeant Chris Gallagher yelled for him to turn towards the shore. He was, he was swimming away from the shore, swimming away, swimming away from hope and rescue. Niagara Police Officer Chris Gallagher yelled for him, swim towards the shore. The man refused and let go of the driftwood that was he was hanging on to and began to swim right back into the current, right into the ice, chunks of ice. A helicopter flew over and got low, and they, they lowered a pole. All he had to do was wrap the rope around him, and they'd pull him out of the water. And, and you know what he did? They dropped it right on him. The rope surrounded him. But you know what he did? He threw the rope off, him, off of him and again swam towards the terrible, dead, deadly waves. Rescuers raced against the clock. He was already in that water for 30 minutes. And guess what? He was getting weaker and weaker. Firefighter Ted Brunning jumped into the river and swam to him and the man who was perishing 200 foot from the shore and literally rescued him that day. Listen, authorities concluded that the man wasn't thinking right. Duh. A lot of people today not thinking right. We think we can get by with it. We're thinking the wrong direction. We're looking the wrong direction. Jesus sees more than just one person in critical, a critical care. He sees people everywhere of life literally headed towards hell. The path of sin does not have a good ending. Enjoy it. That's the only enjoyment you'll ever have. Play with it. It's the only time you're going to play. Despite the clear warning that hell is ahead, people swim with the current. And they really swim with their sin, unrepentant, even though the clock is running out. Time is running out, my friend. The rescuers try to reach you and trying to reach you, but you resist the one who's trying to rescue you. Not everyone wants to be saved from their sin. Not everyone wants to be saved from their perils. Not everyone wants to be close to Jesus and look into the Word and find the answer. Not everyone wants to abandon their course of sin. Not everyone wants to come to Jesus. I found that out over and over again. They want to stay. It ought to break our heart. We see people who refuse to repent. Otherwise, they just reject God, reject God's Word. It ought to break our heart when they do that, when they reject the truth and they don't even realize it. We ought to break our heart when people who are destroying their lives, it ought to break our heart when people reject the cure. God uses people with broken hearts. I cannot be used and you cannot be used and so, until people see their hurt in our heart, their hurt in our eyes. When they see tears rolling down our cheeks, when they see our brokenness and sometimes our weak people before them. Remember one time I come in the house one night and I heard my mama praying and she was calling out my name and I heard her weeping, weeping, weeping. Oh God, Tim. Oh God, Tim. Oh God, Tim. She was bro oh so broken over my life and my ways. She was on her knees, and it was late, still crying out to God, Oh God, oh God, save him. There's a song written by Brian Leach. Let your heart be broken. Let me read a couple of verses. Let your heart be broken for a world in need. Feed the mouse that hunger and soothe the wounds that bleed. Give the cup of water and the loaf of bread. Be the hands of Jesus, servant in his stead. Here on earth, applying the principles of love, visibly expression, God still rules above. To the rinds of all who've been seen or heard, blessed to be by blessing and privileged to care. Challenged be the need, apparent, apparent everywhere, where mankind is wanting, filled with vacant places. Be the means to which God or the Lord reviews, re reveals His grace. Add to your belief in deeds that prove its truth, knowing Christ as Savior, making Him the Master. Follow His footsteps and go where He has trod. In the world, great trouble, risk yourself for God. Let your heart be timber, tender and your vision clear. See mankind as God sees it. Serve him far and near. Let your heart be broken by a brother's pain. Share your rich resources. Give and give again. Oh God, help us. Help us to see people who literally are not repenting and not returning to you. Oh God, help us see people who accept, will not accept your word. Oh God, help us see people who are lost and headed towards the damnation of hell itself. Oh God, please 
open my eyes to see people who are the hours so late. Help me somehow reveal to them time is short. You may be 10, you may be 20, you may be 30. You don't know when your day is up. I have buried little babies, newborn. I have buried children 10 years old and younger. I have buried teenagers. I have buried young couples. I have buried 20 to 30. I have buried 30 to 40, 50 to 60, and oh so on. I have buried them all. And every one of them, no matter how old they are, 60, 70, 80, it will tell you, where did time go? Raise a child, and that child starts to get married, and you say, I can't believe it. Time went by like that. It's easy to look back on your life and say that was fast. It's hard to look forward in your life because you think it's a long time. We are deceived. The hour is coming any day. I tell people there's a point that a man wants to die. We have an appointment with God. God tells us when we're going to die, but sometimes we determine how we're going to die. Get in the car and hit a tree. You just determine how you're going to die that time, but God already knew the time. We can destroy our health. And it was our fault we died, but it was God already knew that's the day we're going to die. God, open our eyes. Open our eyes. And help us speak the cure with tender hearts and loving hearts to those who refuse to get the cure. Don't stop giving the cure just because they say no. Continue to offer the cure. Now I'm asking you, who in the world do you know that doesn't know Jesus? Is our hearts broken over it? Maybe a family member. Maybe a best friend. May it be a co-worker. Someone that you see every day. And maybe some that you don't, someone you don't even know, but you know by their lifestyle they're not right with God. Does it break your heart? When you, have a, you go to a funeral and you know by the lifestyle of a person, unless they got saved in the last moments of their life, you know. You know, if they didn't turn to Jesus, they're headed or they're in hell or going to hell. Let me ask you something. Does that break your heart? Does that break your heart? It ought to. I'm so glad that someone cared enough for me that they got on their knees and they cried out to God. I'm so glad that a man who led me to the Lord led me to the Lord and he was crying through it all. His heart was broken. His heart was so broken. And sometimes he couldn't even talk to me. Sometimes all he could say is, Oh, Tim. Oh, Tim. As parents, oh, it breaks our heart, young people, when you're not right with God and grandparents and friends and neighbors and brothers and sisters, whoever it is, if they're truly right with God, they know that someone had a broken heart for them. Someone touched heaven for them, and they got saved. They not only accepted the word, but they literally repented and said, Oh God, I want to live for you. i got to stop doing things. Oh, my friend, where are you? Are you the one who has the broken heart? Are you the one who someone's heart is broken because of you? Two types of people. Broken-hearted people are those who will care, who don't care, and reject. But God cries out for them. All heads are bowed and eyes are closed. You may be here this morning. God may be talking to you because you were saved and you know the Lord. But it's been a while since your heart's been broken. Maybe you're aware you're saying, you know what? I prayed and prayed and prayed and they're not getting saved. I quit. Don't ever give up on anybody unless it, when they still have life. You don't know. There is a final prayer. There is a final time that they could be reached if we continued. Or maybe you're the one who's rejected God who won't repent. And you're saying today, you know what? You know what? Someone truly cares for me. Someone's praying for me. Someone that's got a broken heart. And I'm asking this morning, will you have that broken heart? Will you go to that person who's not right with you? Love them. Love them. Love them into Jesus. Talk to them. Have your heart broken as Jesus' heart was broken, as Jeremiah's heart was broken. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Maybe hear you this morning. And maybe you know someone has a broken heart for you. You're not where you need to be. You know about God. You know about Jesus. 
You know that he died on the cross for your sins. And you may be at times weeping. Many at times you cry. You're, you just know that you're not where you need to be. And maybe this morning you realize how broken God was, how broken Jeremiah was, how broken your mom or dad or grandparents, brother or sister, whoever it is, you know their hearts are broken. They're not mad at you. They're concerned about you. You're here this morning. You'll say, Pastor, I'm the one that's broke the heart of God and broken this individual for me. Pray for me this morning. Now, no one's looking around. I'm, I'm talking to you at the best, best time in your life. You'll just say, Preacher, I'll not call your name. I'll not come to you. But I do desperately want to pray for you. You'll say, Pastor, pray for me this morning. I truly want to. God bless you. Are there others? Just raise your hand and put it right down. All over this building. Preacher, pray for me. Maybe you're here this morning. You're saved. You know God. But there's an individual in your life he was brokenhearted for. But through time, your heart's kind of grown cold or hard. And you quit weeping for him, and sometimes we quit praying for him. You know that person. I preach, I prayed so many years, it just they're just not going to. We don't know. We've got to have enough faith that literally will break our hearts. You'll say, Preacher, help me be brokenhearted again for that individual. Oh God, I want him saved. Would you slip up your hand on this building? God bless you. Numerous hands are up. Dear Lord, this morning, you know the hearts of individuals, you know the lives of individuals. And oh God, this morning. Speak to them today. God, our hearts are broken for those who don't know you, those who've shunned you, turned away from you. Lord, help us. Help us, Lord. Always to be concerned with that individual. Help us also to make sure our heart is in the place where God's heart is, Jeremiah's heart was. Break our hearts for what broke your heart. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Would you stand?